Chapter Two of Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Two On the Road to Opar. It was two weeks later that John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, riding in from a tour of inspection of his vast African estate, glimpsed the head of a column of men crossing the plain that lay between his bungalow and the forest to the north and west. He reined in his horse and watched the little party as it emerged from a concealing swale. His keen eyes caught the reflection of the sun upon the white helmet of a mounted man, and with the conviction that a wandering European hunter was seeking his hospitality, he wheeled his mount and rode slowly forward to meet the newcomer. A half hour later he was mounting the steps leading to the veranda of his bungalow, and introducing M. Jules Fercourt to Lady Greystoke. "'I was completely lost,' M. Fercourt was explaining. "'My headman had never before been in this part of the country, and the guides who were to have accompanied me from the last village we passed knew even less of the country than we. They finally deserted us two days since.' I am very fortunate indeed to have stumbled so providentially upon succor. I do not know what I should have done had I not found you. It was decided that Fekul and his party should remain several days, or until they were thoroughly rested, when Lord Greystoke would furnish guides to lead them safely back into country with which Fekul's headman was supposedly familiar. In his guise of a French gentleman of leisure, Werper found little difficulty in deceiving his host, and in ingratiating himself with both Tarzan and Jane Clayton. But the longer he remained, the less hopeful he became of an easy accomplishment of his designs. Lady Greystoke never rode alone at any great distance from the bungalow, and the savage loyalty of the ferocious Waziri warriors, who formed a great part of Tarzan's followers, seemed to preclude the possibility of a successful attempt at forcible abduction, or of the bribery of the Waziri themselves. A week passed, and Werper was no nearer the fulfillment of his plan, in so far as he could judge, than upon the day of his arrival. But at that very moment something occurred which gave him renewed hope, and set his mind upon an even greater reward than a woman's ransom. A runner had arrived at the bungalow with the weekly mail, and Lord Greystoke had spent the afternoon in his study reading and answering letters. At dinner he seemed distraught, and early in the evening he excused himself and retired, Lady Greystoke following him very soon after. Werper, sitting upon the veranda, could hear their voices in earnest discussion, and having realized that something of unusual moment was afoot, he quietly rose from his chair and keeping well in the shadow of the shrubbery growing profusely about the bungalow, made his silent way to a point beneath the window of the room in which his host and hostess slept. Here he listened, and not without result, for almost the first words he overheard filled him with excitement. Lady Greystoke was speaking as Werper came within hearing. "'I always feared for the stability of the company,' she was saying, but it seems incredible that they should have failed for so enormous a sum unless there has been some dishonest manipulation. That is what I suspect, replied Tarzan, but whatever the cause, the fact remains that I have lost everything, and there is nothing for it but to return to Opar and get more. Oh, John, cried Lady Greystoke, and Werper could feel the shudder through her voice. Is there no other way? I cannot bear to think of you returning to that frightful city. I would rather live in poverty always than to have you risk the hideous dangers of Opar. You need have no fear, replied Tarzan, laughing. I am pretty well able to take care of myself, and were I not, the Waziri who will accompany me will see that no harm befalls me. They ran away from Opar once and left you to your fate, she reminded him. They will not do it again, he answered. They were very much ashamed of themselves, and were coming back when I met them. But there must be some other way, insisted the woman. There is no other way half so easy to obtain another fortune, 
as to go to the treasure vaults of Opar and bring it away, he replied. I shall be very careful, Jane, and the chances are that the inhabitants of Opar will never know that I have been there again and despoiled them of another portion of the treasure, the very existence of which they are as ignorant of as they would be of its value. The finality in his tone seemed to assure Lady Greystoke that further argument was futile, and so she abandoned the subject. Werper remained, listening for a short time, and then, confident that he had overheard all that was necessary, and fearing discovery, returned to the veranda where he smoked numerous cigarettes in rapid succession before retiring. The following morning, at breakfast, Werper announced his intention of making an early departure, and asked Tarzan's permission to hunt big game in the Waziri country on his way out permission which Lord Greystoke readily granted. The Belgian consumed two days in completing his preparations, but finally got away with his safari accompanied by a single Waziri guide whom Lord Greystoke had loaned him. The party made but a single short march when Werper simulated illness and announced his intention of remaining where he was until he had fully recovered. As they had gone but a short distance from the Greystoke bungalow, Werper dismissed the Waziri guide, telling the warrior that he would send for him when he was able to proceed. The Waziri gone, the Belgian summoned one of Achmet Zek's trusted blacks to his tent and dispatched him to watch for the departure of Tarzan, to return immediately to advise Werper of the event and the direction taken by the Englishman. The Belgian did not have long to wait. For the following day his emissary returned with word that Tarzan and a party of fifty Waziri warriors had set out toward the southeast early in the morning. Werper called his headman to him, after writing a long letter to Achmet Zek. This letter he handed to the headman. "'Send a runner at once to Achmet Zek with these,' he instructed the headman. "'Remain here in camp awaiting further instructions from him or from me.' If any come from the bungalow of the Englishman, tell them that I am very ill within my tent and can see no one. Now give me six porters and six askari, the strongest and bravest of the safari, and I will march after the Englishman and discover where his gold is hidden. And so it was that as Tarzan stripped to the loincloth and armed after the primitive fashion he best loved, led his loyal Waziri toward the dead city of Opar. Werper, the renegade, haunted his trail through the long hot days and camped close behind him by night. And as they marched, Achmet Zek rode with his entire following southward toward the Greystoke farm. To Tarzan of the Apes, the expedition was in the nature of a holiday outing. His civilization was at best but an outward veneer, which he gladly peeled off with his uncomfortable European clothes whenever any reasonable pretext presented itself. It was a woman's love which kept Tarzan even to the semblance of civilization, a condition for which familiarity had bred contempt. He hated the shams and the hypocrisies of it, and with the clear vision of an unspoiled mind he had penetrated to the rotten core of the heart of the thing, the cowardly greed for peace and ease and the safeguarding of property rights. That the fine things of life, art, music, and literature, had thriven upon such enervating ideals, he strenuously denied, insisting rather that they had endured in spite of civilization. Show me the fat, opulent coward, he was wont to say, who ever originated a beautiful ideal. In the clash of arms, in the battle for survival, amid hunger and death and danger, in the face of God as manifested in the display of nature's most terrific forces, is born all that is finest and best in the human heart and mind. And so Tarzan always came back to nature in the spirit of a lover keeping a long-deferred tryst after a period behind prison walls. His Waziri at Merrill were more civilized than he. They cooked their meat before they ate it, and they shunned many articles of food as unclean that Tarzan had eaten with gusto all his life, 
and so insidious is the virus of hypocrisy that even the stalwart ape-man hesitated to give rein to his natural longings before them. He ate burnt flesh when he would have preferred it raw and unspoiled, and he brought down game with arrow or spear when he would far rather have leaped upon it from ambush and sunk his strong teeth in its jugular. But at last the call of the milk of the savage mother that had suckled him in infancy rose to an insistent demand. He craved the hot blood of a fresh kill, and his muscles yearned to pit themselves against the savage jungle in the battle for existence that had been his sole birthright for the first twenty years of his life. End of chapter 2